on today's story beat. I tell all the actors that we're working for you. You're not working for us. Um, you tell us what days you're available. That's when we'll schedule. If you can't make it on a given day, we'll work around it. Even if jobs come up, sometimes I've had actors cancel the same day. You know, can't make it, something else came up. All right, we'll work around it. That's highly unusual in that business. I mean, that's incredible. Well, unusual. it is, but again, because there's no budget here, so I'm not employing these people. In fact, I don't consider it like I'm hiring an actor to be in a movie. I'm inviting them to be a part of this experience. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, indie filmmaker Mark Perot, arrived in Hollywood in 1974, dreaming of a filmmaking career. With no connections, relatives, or friends in the industry, he quickly met other artists with the same dream. After making a few short films in the late 70s, he produced his first feature in 1981, a comedy entitled A Polish Vampire in Burbank. The 84-minute film cost under $2,500 to produce and ultimately grossed over a half million dollars in home video and cable TV sales. Keep in mind, this was long before today's digital age of filmmaking. Mark has written 10 feature films, edited and directed nine, produced six, scored and executive produced one, all tailored for the home video cable TV markets. Many gained cult status, like his 1991 film, Nudist Colony of the Dead. His films have appeared on HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, and USA Network. Mark has been featured on Entertainment Tonight, Fox News, A Current Affair, and Hard Copy. He's also been on the lecture circuit, speaking to filmmaking classes at colleges like UCLA. Other notable films Mark has completed include Color Blinded, which is about a black girl who becomes white, and the offbeat comedy Rectuma, which is about a mutant 200-foot ass that rampages through the country. Rectuma screened at the 2004 Cannes Film Festival and the 2005 Berlin Film Festival. The God Complex, released in 2009, is a retelling of the Bible's silliest stories with the Pyramount slant. To see much more about Mark and his films, please be sure to check out Pyramount.com. And on a side note, Mark and I have known one another for more years than we're going to admit, having met while we both gave tours at Universal Studios Hollywood back when the tour actually lasted two to three hours. So for all those reasons and many more, this is one of the great joys for me to have as my guest on Storybeat today, my friend Mark Perot. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it is more than a great pleasure for me. So let's go back to your, your roots. Um, where did you first start to think about becoming a filmmaker? What were your inspirations and influences early on? When did you start thinking about it? Oh, God, I probably as far back as I can remember. I always loved movies. Um, I basically was, um, uh, I, I was given a movie camera when I was 13 by my parents, and I was so in, in love with it that I just got together with friends and classmates, and we started making these 10-minute short films. Um, and then ultimately, I, I took a trip to California, took the Universal Studios tour, and discovered that wow, I make movies just like real people do, only hmm. not quite as big. What, what, kind of, what kind of movies and TV shows did you watch as a kid? As a kid, I watched a lot of cartoons. I watched Batman, Superman TV shows. Um, I was not, I'm trying to think of any other sitcom-y kind of shows I ever really watched. I wasn't really big into television, but I love movies. I used to be a James Bond fan when I was younger, uh, back in the days when James Bond was handsome. And I kind of, uh, yeah, I'm not a big Daniel Craig fan, but anyway, I kind of, uh, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess I just liked the whole concept of film and filmmaking and started doing these. So, so you didn't get any training at all, did you? You didn't go to school for this? No, no. I started, as I said, at 13. And as I was making these short films, I just kind of developed my own technique, I guess. And I was shooting it on Super 8, which was a home movie medium that probably a lot of people don't even know about today. 
but it was when they would shoot with a little camera that had a pistol grip on it. I'd be afraid to use it today. As a matter of fact, probably get shot. But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you put in a cartridge, you'd shoot for two and a half minutes, then you'd have to put in another cartridge. And that's how it was. All right. So, so you were, you and I met at Universal Studios Hollywood, and I knew that you had a dream of making movies then because you would, we would talk about making movies. I had that same dream, by the way. Um, and so, but beyond being a tour guide, what were your first jobs in the business? What did you do that you could make money and still observe or be around the business? What, what kind of things did you do? Well, the only job I had that really kept me around the business was being the tour guide at Universal, but I also worked at a movie theater. Uh, the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. I was an usher there. I got to see a lot of free movies. I made friends with projectionists all up and down Hollywood Boulevard. So I got to see a lot of free movies. Um, did did and you then, find that helpful to see a lot of movies? Was that helpful to you or is it just fun? Yeah, well, I did it for fun mainly, but I suppose the more movies you see, the more you kind of develop a sense for storytelling. So, um, but it was, if, if anything, it was a subconscious thing. How, and then uh, how many movies had you made prior to even getting to Hollywood? 10, 12, 13 movies? Uh, I made mean about, yeah, I made mean about six or seven, I think, short films. And, um, and so it, you were already a storyteller. You, you knew you wanted to tell stories. Right. But they were short. They were 10 minute movies or less. And then when I came out here and I, I was out here in California for about five years and hadn't done anything, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go out and buy myself a, another Super 8 outfit and get a camera projector editor and then start making movies again so i started making short films again using tour guide fellow tour guides that they all wanted to be actors so that wasn't a problem and then after two short films out here i did my first feature and i shot it in super eight for twenty five hundred dollars for, for twenty five hundred bucks which is nothing i mean that's not even lunch for jim carrey well, that's true. We want to laugh. It's cheaper to make a movie now because of the technology. Well, it is. that That's absolutely true. So the Super 8 technology, because I used to shoot on Super 8 too, um, you were getting a reversal print. You were actually getting the, the, you didn't have a negative to work with. So you had to be very careful how you used, how you shot and how you edited. Absolutely. You had to pretty much commit to your cuts. And as you make the cuts, I would always, I would cut longer shots and then trim it down because if you cut it too short, it's very difficult to put footage back in. And that was a pretty good training ground. Don't you think that's still a good technique, even if you have limitless amounts of footage you to, to go long? Well, it's a, it's a good technique, but I don't think anybody needs to do it today just because video is cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, you, sh you shoot your movie on, uh, on HD video or whatever you can, uh, that that's one of the problems really too, because when you've got all of this footage, it, it becomes a nightmare when you're editing it because now instead of looking for just small takes, like when I would shoot in Super 8, we would only shoot pretty much what we needed to shoot. If I knew mm -hmm. we were going to cut to a close up, I would only shoot the long shot up to the point where we're going to cut to the close up. Now, because of uh, the technology, you'll shoot the whole scene again and again and again. So, how much planning did you have to do? Were you really well planned out even in the early days? I, I would say pretty good. Um, you know, we would set up a day to shoot. Uh, schedule the actors, schedule the location, go out, do it. And then we might not schedule another day for maybe a week or more. Uh, because again, nobody was getting paid. So we had to work around our schedules and our jobs. Um, a lot of times we'd set up a day and maybe an actor would not show up or speak or whatever. So we'd have to shoot a different day or we shoot around that actor and then go back. But yeah, there's all kinds of problems that come up when you're, you know, when you have no budget. So, so let's talk about your process on once you have an idea, where, where do you get your ideas Is it from everywhere? Or do you have sources that you normally turn to? Like, I want to think about doing this kind of a movie. So you go to those sources or how do you come up with ideas? You know, I, I don't even really know how they, I come up with, I'll, I'll come up with an idea, like say, Oh, I, I think this would make a funny movie. Like when we did, uh, I did a movie called Rectuma, which is about a giant ass that terrorizes Los Angeles. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I think I was probably thinking in terms of Godzilla, you know, and there were so many Godzilla movies. And I said, you know, asses are funny. I mean, guy asses are funny. Women asses, not so funny, but guy asses are funny. So this, the concept of a guy's ass basically becoming a homicidal maniac is funny. And I don't think it's ever been done. I try to come up with ideas that nobody's ever done before. That's that's getting more and more difficult. 
um, when we did the God complex, nobody's ever made a comedy about the Bible. Now well, they danced around it. Like you're going to say Monty Python probably. Yeah, right. Right. But that didn't really, that didn't really hit the Bible. It was sort of like the story of the you know next door neighbor to Jesus. My film takes the stories right out of the Bible from Noah, burning bush, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, um, Abraham and Isaac. I mean, you know, it, it really covers all the stories of the Bible, but it does it with a very bizarre slant. With a and pure amount take. Have you seen it yet? I have not seen that one. Go to Tubi. It's there. Tubi TV. You'll on it. Tubi TV, you can find the God Complex. You can find most of my movies on Tubi. All right. So, well, that's good to know. Um, and all right. So now you have an idea. Your idea is I want to make a movie about stories from the Bible. That's your idea. Where right. do you begin from there? Do you have you will you go and re read the Bible and start to actually look for parody in there? What happened was we started uh, my friend and I had started collaborating on a script. I had a friend who went by the name Godless Bastard. He had a website. <laughs> Very funny guy. And I, uh, <laughs> I said, you know, let's work on a script about God or religion. And we started a script called uh, Jesus Christ Conquers the Martians. That was what I started writing. Uh, it was a funny idea. You know, Mars finds out that they've got people getting too smart and they want to figure out how do we dumb our people down? Well, what do they use on Earth? Well, they got this thing called Jesus that kind of keeps people down. Oh, OK, yeah, let's try that. So they kidnap Jesus, bring him up to Mars, and he fucks up the planet. Anyway, that script got about halfway through it, and then it just didn't go anywhere. And I said, this isn't really working. But then I thought, you know, let's just go to the Bible and take the silly stories that are in there anyway and just kind of make them a little sillier. So we've got now Adam and Eve. And, um, and I mean, it, it's hard to describe all the different stories that we use, but I, I did go to some of the more popular stories of the Bible, like uh, the the um, Noah's Ark is really, um, uh, it's the world's first Holocaust when you think about it, right? God wanted to do some ethnic cleansing, so he cleaned up the world. And it, but not, um, Noah, and I mean, not Noah, but uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac, that's the first story of child abuse, really, because, you know, he takes his kid up to the mountain to kill him. Uh, uh, the story about uh, Virgin Mary, that's the first story of a um, rape, you know, only it's a, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, statutory rape, you know, because she was about 14, 15 years old. So, and the burning bush in our movie is uh, Moses, Moses's wife, her crotch starts on fire and Jesus's head or God's head appears there. That's the burning bush part of the story. I'm giving away too much, but <laughs> when you take every little piece of this uh, movie and you put it together, you got a pretty damn funny movie, and it's not the greatest story ever told. It, no, that would not. No, that would not be the greatest story ever told. And and um, a taste does not come into this uh, picture at all, right? Uh, you could probably put that on any of my films. I, I've never really worried about what people are going to think or say or be offended. I made a movie called Curse of the Queer Wolf. Uh, that was one of my first Super 8 films. And that was about a guy that turns transgender when the moon rises. <laughs> okay, now, that this was made 30 some odd years ago. So this is before transgenders became, you know, popular. Um, but he goes through this transformation. He gets bitten on the butt by a dickenthrope, which is a queer wolf. And then what happens is, is anytime the moon rises, he becomes one. So his eyelashes grow out and his fingernails grow with nail polish already on them and stocking or socks become mesh stockings. And uh, it's really the wolf man. It's the story of the wolf man told this way. But Back then, people said, geez, you know, this might be going a little off, you know, <laughs> off the line here. And I don't, you know, I, I, it doesn't really concern me if people are offended. I'm more interested in entertaining people that get the jokes. Well, uh, you and I have known one another a long time, and I've never known you to fear offending anyone. Oh, of course not. I think some people deserve to be offended. You know, I mean, we did a movie called Colorblinded about a, a black girl that turns white. And then later on, towards the end of the movie, she turns black again. And everybody's astonished. They say, what's happening? It, it, maybe it was funnier 20 years ago when we made the movie. But it's to me, again, it's it, I think if people understand 
they know that these movies are not coming from a hateful place. You know, gays loved Curse of the Queer Wolf because it it really kind of parodies stereotypes of men and how they feel about homosexuality. Uh, the Bible, again, if you're religious, you might have a problem with it, but if you're agnostic and atheist or anybody else with a brain, I think you'll enjoy a movie like that. Uh, you know, Rectuma, well, that's a different story, but I think if you like Godzilla movies, you'd love Rectuma. So. You, you, you didn't, doing Rectuma, you didn't open yourself up to anybody saying your movie shit, did you? Uh, no, but that would have been a good line. In fact, a good friend of mine in San Francisco made a movie called Monster which is about a giant turd monster. And I think it came out around the same time as Rectuma. We thought it'd make a double bill. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your process in terms of once you have an idea, do you then outline or do you just go straight to script? Do you know what you're doing ahead of time? Or how do you, what, what is your process in terms of turning out a script? Well, you ever heard the term, how do you eat an elephant? One, One bite, bite at, at a time, yeah. That's how I would approach a movie. The first thing I do is, you know, you get a script that you're happy with. Um, I try to write the script based on what I have access to. So, for example, my early movies had an Italian restaurant in it because I was friends with Joe Michelli, who owns an Italian restaurant out here. And I've used his restaurant in many, many films. Uh, if I had access to anything, you know, like uh, when we had the God Complex, is the only movie I didn't have access to the kind of buildings you need so I built uh, a set in my backyard and then used it again and again and again um, kind of getting off the subject of what you asked but basically I'll start with the script I'll write it in a way that I know I can do it then I'll start working about casting that's the next step then I'll think about okay what locations can I get what can we use here then I'll start working on a schedule but it's a very loose schedule I tell all the actors that we're working for you. You're not working for us. Um, you tell us what days you're available. That's when we'll schedule. If you can't make it on a given day, we'll work around it. Even if jobs come up, sometimes I've had actors cancel the same day. You know, can't make it. Something else came up. All right, we'll work around it. That's highly unusual in that business. I mean, that's incredibly well, unusual. Well, it is. But again, because there's no budget here, so I'm not employing these people. In fact, I don't consider it like I'm hiring an actor to be in a movie. I'm inviting them to be a part of this experience. So, so, so when you say no budget, what's the most money you've spent on a movie? Me personally or a movie what, that I made? No, I'm talking about that, you, that you've made. You, that, what is the most expensive production that you've had? Well, the most expensive production that I've had was a movie called Buford's Beach Bunnies, which I did not finance. That was through another company. And that one, they spent about $400,000. Mm -hmm. That was 35 millimeter. And you, and you wrote that? I wrote it, yeah. And the directed next, it. I, and I directed it, and I was, uh, I edited it too. Yeah, I edited it. Then just below that, we did a movie called Death Row Game Show, which was about a guy that runs a, con uh, a game show for convicts on death row, and he figures they'll execute him right on the air, or they'll win prizes for their family, you know. And, and anyway, that one was uh, financed by Crown International Pictures, and that was about 200000 Below that was a movie called Nudist Colony of the Dead, which is a musical comedy. Um, and that was shot for about $25,000. And that was an outside company that put in a little bit of money. And we did that one that way. Everything after or everything be besides that were um, all financed by myself. And the most I think I ever spent on anything on my own was probably between five and $10,000. So, so I want the listeners to understand what Mark is talking about. When he self-financed his movies, he's making feature length movies for pretty much not much <laughs> for very uh, little. Exactly. And, and, and you're, and you're, uh, you're happy to accommodate the people that are working with you because you know that they're getting little or nothing. Correct. Well, yeah, I mean, if they're actors, they're getting uh, roles. And usually if you're an actor, you can't sit around waiting for Martin Scorsese to call. Or you can, you know, you can go do some local theater or you can try somehow to get some experience. But when we put these movies together, we make them look as good as we possibly can. And, and I get a lot of the same actors over and over again. So, you know, we'll use them as uh, projects come along. So, so in other words, um, people are doing it a, li a little bit so that they get maybe some real footage for them. Oh, absolutely. When we did Nudist Colony of the Dead, we got uh, Entertainment Tonight to cover it. We got hard copy. 
uh, Current Affair, Fox News, all these different shows came to cover our film. A lot of the actors got publicity out of it. And the last film or two films ago, we did a movie called Rage of Innocence. The lead actress, while we were making the film, got a part in The Hunger Games. And I'm not, it wasn't because of our film, obviously. We were in production. And one of the deals I have with everybody I've ever worked with in a film is I, I'm basically their editor or filmmaker for life. Hmm. So if they have a project that they want me to help them with, I do that. I, I, I'll help them put a demo reel together if they've got a commercial, whatever. So, and it, and it goes without saying, they don't even need to, you know, I mean, we don't even need to really ask. It's just, you need something, I'll do it for you. I have a DP who's worked on several of my films. And if he has a project, I'm there. You what know, do you shoot on mostly it. these days? What, what have you been shooting? Have you been shooting video? Uh, yeah, the, when we started, uh, started shooting video in 98 with Colorblinded, that was high eight video. Then after that, Rectuma came along. That was digital video, just your standard DV. Then the God Complex was shot in HD, uh, as was, uh, let me see, wait a minute. After God Complex came Rage of Innocence, which was HD. Then we did um, Celluloid Soul, which was HD. And then the current film I'm doing right now called The Deceased Won't Desist is being done in 4K. So. Wow. Yeah, you're, you're all the way up to 4K at this point. Oh, hell, you can get 4K with an iPhone. now. I know. I know. So, <laughs> you, know. you can. You can get the 4K with an iPhone, which is just amazing. It um, really are you, is. Are you shooting on an iPhone or are you shooting on a on a pro camera? Um, we're, we were using a pro camera for most of it, but the iPhone we used for supplemental stuff. Uh, like if we needed to shoot some B-roll stuff, I would shoot the iPhone if um we did. In fact, one day we went to shoot and we we didn't have a, a SIM card that was working correctly for the camera. So we ended up shooting the whole scene with the iPhone. And I defy anybody to tell you know which scene it was because it's it's 4K. It looks beautiful. That's amazing. That really it is really amazing. Is. All right. So now you've got it. You've got a script. You've raised whatever money you needed to raise, whether it's yourself or whether companies come in. What are your first steps? What are you doing? I know we've already talked about you've you've already thought about what locations you you're going to use. You kind of probably have thought whether you have props and that kind of thing available or whether you're going to have to build them or buy them or rent them. And so my question is once you are sort of I guess I'll loosely term the use, use the term green lit. Uh, mm -hmm. what is your first step? What is your process in terms of getting ready to to actually make the movie to go into production? Okay, let's see. Um, the first thing I do once everything is set to go is I, I set a day and I say, okay, we, we pick a scene and we say, okay, it involves three of the actors. I check with them to see, are you available on this day at this time? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Then I'll put a little call sheet together. What props do I need for that day? I only think about that day. Uh, you know, I, I, we go out, we shoot. I've got a, literally a crew of two people, sometimes three. We'll have a guest star once in a while show up and hold a cable for us or whatever, but mostly <laughs> it's just a couple of us. We'll go out, we'll do whatever we need to do for that one day, and then we regroup. So, you know, so, after that so day. Let, let me ask you, you're using non-SAG actors, correct? No, I use SAG actors. Um, sometimes, I, I don't care if they're SAG or not. I, I have no signatory with SAG. Um, there was a time when SAG tried to basically bully me into joining SAG, becoming a signatory, I mean, uh, or stop using SAG actors. And they have no authority over me. So, you know, they, they called in a bunch of my actors on the board and basically told them to tell Mark to stop using SAG actors. And I said, what they're trying to do is they're trying to shoot hostages in front of me. I said, I have no you know, reason to not use a SAG actor if they want to be in my film. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll either change a name. I don't care. These movies fly under the radar. And, uh, you know, after I think it was after Death Row Game Show, SAG tried to clamp down on my actors. And most of them just told them to go, you know, screw themselves, basically. Interesting. In a nice way. In, in yeah. a nice way, obviously. You are, um, I would say, fearless of Hollywood then. What's the fear? I'm not I'm not robbing banks. I'm not going out and doing brain surgery. I'm entertaining. I'm making films. And, you know, I, I 
we, sh you know, we don't do what normal people do when they make movies. In fact, when I talk at schools, I used to talk at some schools and I, I would say to them, uh, whatever I tell you today, <laughs> you can take it with a grain of salt or not do it at all. But anything you've learned in your film school may not apply to what we're doing. When you're producing and directing, which is what you do mostly, um, do you, f how do you deal with pressure? You know, Steve, there really isn't because there's, you know, the term time is money doesn't really apply when we shoot our films. Um, if we've got a day to shoot and we've got a location and most of the time the locations are free. The only time I've really paid for locations is if we there's there's a couple of great sound stages out here that'll charge you by the hour. So for seventy five dollars an hour, you got a hospital bed or you got a jail cell or whatever is needed. So. Um, no, there's never really, I don't think any of my actors will tell you there's ever been pressure on any of my sets. Uh, again, there's nobody spending a lot of money and the time that we spend is the time. It's like we all went to a barbecue and we had a good time and we walked away, you know, with something that we're happy with. Um, I can't think of a time. I've never raised my voice on a set. Um, I never, even when an actor sucks, which happens occasionally, uh, I'll never really push the actor and I'll just say, you know, okay, come on. I'm not Steven Spielberg. Relax, <laughs> you know, and we, uh, we get through it. You, you do realize, <laughs> I assume how truly unusual this is. <laughs> well, I bet there are more people doing it than, you know, I mean, since the not, digital age, not, not at, at your level of success where you've turned out one after the other. I think people do it maybe once, but not 10 times, not multiple times. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you have to really like what you're doing. It's sort of like it's a gift that there's enough people that support what I do that are happy to be a part of it because you need people to be in your movie. You need people to help you on the production. I've had many people that said, can I help you with your next film? Anything. I got a guy that comes out here from San Francisco, a five hour drive just to do a cameo in, in my two films and he'll drive out here, do his cameo, and then drive back to San Francisco in the day. That's because amazing. he Because he wanted to be a part of this. I got a couple of other friends, coincidentally, in San Francisco, not related, different people, that contacted me one time and said, you know, if there's anything we can help you with in your film, we'd love to help you. And I said, when I was doing the God Complex, so, well, I need a bunch of people dressed in biblical outfits just doing their business, gathering flowers, going to the to a pond. I don't care what they're doing because God in my movie sits in a giant video room and he watches everybody on monitors. So I said, while he's sitting there, I need to see him looking at a bunch of people just doing, you know, biblical things. And they shot about 40 different people doing things, you know, gathering flowers, picking up rocks, getting in the streets and put it together. Now they made a couple of films themselves and I helped them with their stuff, doing stuff out here, or I did cameos in their films. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's like when you, it, it's almost like a fraternity, you know, you get people that want to help people. Well, would you know what to do if somebody said to you, Mark, we want to give you a hundred million dollars to make a movie? Would you? Oh, absolutely. I'd make a movie and then take $99 million and go to the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need $99 million to go to the Bahamas, Mark. The way I do, you do. <laughs> I'd be on my private jet. No, he's so, not. Sorry. Here so now you're you're clearly not working with marquee names as your actors. These are not famous people. Uh, not per se. I mean, when we started Polish Vampire, we had Eddie Deason. You know who he is? Yes, sure. Yeah, 19, he was going to start. 1941. 1941, Greece. I want to hold your hand. Uh, yeah, he did a lot of things. And he was going to be the star of my vampire film. And then about a month into production, he kind of said, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore because it really wasn't like the kind of movie making he was used to. So he left the project. That was kind of close to a name. Um, so, we had so, Judy how, so how do you go about casting? What is, what is your casting process? I assume it's important to you that somebody fits a part. It's not just anybody. Well, yeah, but you know, if you can get somebody that's close to a name, like, uh, you know, the comedian Judy Tenuta, Sure. She she was in my last film and, you know, we, we were friends. She did it as a favor to me because we've done some things together in the past. But, um, you know, that helps. I almost got a Bond girl in one of my films and she she backed out at the last minute. 
Um, and, and when I get these people that are names or semi names or sort of names, it's mainly because they, they enjoy the process or they like the script or it's certainly not for the money. Mm -hmm. The last movie that we did prior to my last movie, um, where the lead actress, I told you, got a part in the hunger games. And now she's kind of become not a big name, but she's, you know, it looks good on her resume that she had a, a character part in the hunger games. So so, I mean, if you're lucky enough to get somebody that has any kind of name value, it'll it'll give your a little more uh, production value and it'll give it a little more credibility. But it's rare that you're going to get, you know, any name. So so making movies is a highly <laughs> collaborative act. You're working with many different people in diff many different ways, from your technicians to your actors to all sorts of different people, whether you're co-writing it with somebody. Um what do you think makes good collaboration work? How do you work with people that you think you're successful doing? What makes it great? I think you got to make them understand that it's not your film alone, that they are participating in it. They'll, I'll listen to any idea that comes along. If they say, I got a great idea for a scene or something, I may know that I'm not going to use that idea. I may know that that idea sucks donkey lungs, but at the same time, I'm going to let them get it out and, and try it maybe it will work better than my what I had usually it doesn't but I, I won't just say oh that's a stupid idea go away you know it's kind of like um, anything when you're working with people you want them to feel that they're contributing to something that everybody's going to be happy with and I never talk down to anybody I don't care if it's the person that that's getting the coffee if if we had coffee um, you know I would basically you have no craft services Rarely, but well, when we when we did our last film, um, the one that I'm currently wrapping now, uh, the deceased won't desist. We went up to a cabin for a couple of days up north, and I we we had the actors. I, I said either you can drive yourself up there, <laughs> and, and I'll I'll give you like twenty bucks for gas, or we can carpool. Some carpooled, some drove themselves up. But I went to Costco's and I bought about a hundred dollars worth of turkey rolls and food. So I, I took care of craft services up at the cabin because there really was nothing else to do or eat up there. That was mostly the budget, by the way, on the film, just the food for the couple of days we went up to the cabin. Literally, that was the budget. Um, and you and you all slept in the cabin together. Some. Yes, we did. We uh, the cabin had a couple of beds. And then other than that, we were on the floor in sleeping bags. I told people to bring if they had blankets and uh, it really, I mean, I should have shot behind the scenes of this because that was the fun part. Did it feel like a party to you? Kind of, yeah. You know, I mean, the second time we went to the cabin, it was a little bit more structured because I didn't want to have to keep going back to this cabin. You know, it's it's an hour and a half drive up north. Uh, it's called Pine Mountain Club is the uh, the city that we shot in. The cabin happened to be owned by the man who is doing the music for this movie, Jerry Danielson. Uh, he's the composer. He has a cabin, made it available to us. Yes. So, you and know, that, and but, that's how you do it. You, you doing your whole career to a certain extent has been begging people to do things or asking them and them wanting to and volunteers and borrowing things. And in some cases, probably stealing a few things. So as a beg, borrow yeah, and steal. This blackmail involves sometimes too. You know, blackmail. I got that picture, I have a picture of you and that goat. Uh, you might want to. Oh, me, I up. have, I have that picture. It's not a problem. Oh, okay. I wasn't talking to you specifically, but I mean, oh, it's just, oh. you know, well, you'll say to an actor, uh, no, I revealed something I didn't want to reveal. Yeah. Shame on you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, that, that's part of it. You know, if you've got people, if, if you know somebody that works at a record pressing plant, um, you want to be in my movie? Can we use your record pressing plant? I'll tell you something that nearly happened for the God complex. Um, one of the actors in the film and the man who scored my previous movie, Rectuma, was Andrew Gold. Now, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was a uh, he was a musician. He wrote the song Lonely Boy years ago. His dad was Ernest Gold, who was a composer for movies like Mad Mad World and Exodus. His mom was Marnie Nixon, who did all the singing for Julianne, or not Julianne, sure. just a bit for, uh, you know, um, West Side Story, Natalie Wood. For and Natalie and a lot Wood. Of movies. She did a well, lot of movies, Marnie Nixon. She subbed oh, for absolutely. a lot of people. But when we were doing the God Complex, Andrew Gold was going to do the music for the God Complex. And I said, at the end of the movie, we've got a parody of a lot of these songs that your mother sang. Like, um, we got, if you could pray all night, you could pray all day, but no one will hear you. And we went through this whole 
song or series of songs, she was going to do it. And then he got cancer and ended up not scoring our movie. And then she died. And so it was like, oh, that takes care of that. But that would have been such a coup to have Marty Nixon singing our end theme song. Theme oh, song. my goodness. That would have been a huge coup. I know. But, you know, what what's, can I say? What's the most fun you have with production? What is it you enjoy the most? The part that I enjoy the most, believe it or not, is when we're done and I'm editing the movie. Because when you're editing it, you have you have more control than when you're on the set. There's all these variables when you're shooting, you don't know what's gonna happen. One time we were shooting and we were asked for a permit. Now, we didn't have a permit, but I didn't think we looked professional enough to be bothered. So I had, uh, I, you know, I pulled the guy aside and I said, look, we're shooting with a small camera here. We're not making anything major. And the reason we're doing this is I have a friend who's dying and we wanted to recreate how he met his girlfriend here. And so we were reenacting it and I was gonna, it's just for YouTube. And the guy almost had like tears in his eyes and said, oh, yeah, go ahead. Keep doing what you're doing. Now, the story was crap, but it got us through what we needed. And then, you know, he gave me a little sticker and says, here, no one will bother you now. And, you know, a sticker that says you can film. And I got a gold ticket, you know, but <laughs> but um, but I enjoy the post-production part of it because there you've got 100 percent control as opposed to shooting. And and you're not really out in the world where you you could literally be out of control. Things really could go crazy for you. We, we found a guy that owned a helicopter and he said, uh, yeah, well, you can use it and I'll only charge you for the gas. He didn't charge us for the use of the helicopter, but he said, we can't leave the airport. So we needed a shot where a, a girl in the movie is hanging from a helicopter as it lifts up off the ground. And we had a stunt guy, did it. All I kept thinking about was the Twilight Zone movie, but that didn't happen. We got through it okay, and um, you know we didn't we didn't we did it with no official permits or anything like that. But again, we never left the airport. So all right, so you are known in your low budget way for staging some outrageous scenes and sequences. You have done some really outrageous things. What is it that you? Well, how do you do that? What do you do with when you have so little money to do those things? Like you're talking about, you you got this helicopter. What other kinds of outrageous things have you done? And how did you do it with little or no money? I'm trying to think of really what the definition of outrageous is because, well, okay, I guess right, hanging and, from and, a helicopter. And, <laughs> an, ass, an ass running around and doing things. Well, most of that was all post-production. I mean, we didn't really build a giant ass to, you know, to do things. But I, I, like one time, right, it, it happened not too long after 9-11. We were shooting in, um, oh God, I, I want to say it's by Vasquez Rocks. And it's an area out here where it's all rocky and deserty. And there's a lot of shrubbery and a lot of weeds. Which Vasquez and Rocks is famous for being in tons of movies. Right. Yeah. And, and we actually weren't at Vasquez Rocks for this particular one. I think it was Stony Point was the name of the area. Anyway, we're shooting there. We've got a guy dressed up like an Arab because he was supposed to be a terrorist that was going to kill the giant ass by sh shooting himself or uh, uh, projecting himself into the ass by catapult and then light it on fire from the inside. OK, that's you have to see the movie to understand what's going on. But we were shooting there. <laughs> This guy looks like, you know, he's wearing a, a turban and a towel and the whole thing. He looked like he came from the Middle East. And we're going like, you know, people are starting to walk by here and he looks like a terrorist. And I, I think I, I'd be safer if we were out here with just a book of matches because everybody's looking at us like, what's this guy doing? So we didn't get in any trouble. We didn't have any problems, but that looked very scary. Like we were plotting something, like we were going to do something. And back then the world was a little more terrified, you know, about terrorism. So, you know, we, we well, had to, a, a little to, bit. Today it's really scary sometimes because people don't know what's going on. There's so many. Well, that's things. the other thing too. That's why I said earlier that I would be afraid to shoot with a super eight camera today, because if you remember, it has a pistol grip. And if you're holding the camera like this and pointing it at somebody, all you need is somebody driving by. Oh, my God, it's another mass shooting. I mean, we had when I was in high school, we brought fake guns to school and shot some of my short oh, movies. Oh, on school of course. Campus. No question. No big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Now you wouldn't even think about that. So, yeah. Well, they, would, they, would, they wouldn't let you today. They would stop you. What for you? You know, this is an interesting question. I ask a lot of guests this question. What for you makes a good story good? Why is a story good for you? God, that, that's a tough question to answer only because there's so many elements that make a movie good. 
you know i mean i like movies that a lot of people don't think are good <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> i'm i'm probably one of the few people that actually likes the movie czar does and you know but but for the wrong reasons because you know i used to like sean connery as an actor and i would watch him do just about anything and czar does is probably the weirdest movie he ever made no question so, yeah, but even movies like, you know, I, I knew Plan 9 from Outer Space before it was fashionable to know what was Plan 9 from Outer Space. Right. I remember watching this movie at two in the morning going, somebody made this. Somebody liked it. Somebody nurtured it, you know. Um, but to, when all the elements come together, then you have like a James Cameron movie or a Martin Scorsese where you've got every every element is good. There's some movies that are, you know, they might have good acting but the story might suck or they might have a great story and the acting is mediocre. Sometimes, uh, do you remember Never Say Never Again? That was the reboot of James Bond. <laughs> uh, the well, reboot of Thunderball. Exactly. And I'm looking at that going, okay, Sean Connery's in a tuxedo. Yeah, that good. Okay, check. Uh, some beautiful women. Okay, got to check that. Music, holy Christ, what is the score I'm listening to? And... There were a few other problems because obviously they couldn't follow the formula of James Bond or as much as on anything that wasn't in Thunderball. So obviously there were problems with the movie, but sometimes other things can overcome the bad parts. Am I getting too long winded on this question? No, no what, I, what I'm waiting for you to say, I think, is that, you know, comedy is what salves all wounds. Well, here's the other problem with that is comedy is personal. Just like, uh, you know, so somebody likes pizza, somebody doesn't like pizza, somebody wants pineapple on their pizza. Somebody, you know, it's, it's like some people can look at SNL, Saturday Night Live, and say, I don't think that's funny. I want an apology for that. You insulted me. Don't do that again. And then there's other people that will just say, yeah, it's funny. Or it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's such a personal thing. And when I, when I make a comedy, I try to make what makes me laugh. And it's not easy to make me laugh because I've well, seen it all. Isn't that the the one and only definition of comedy? Does it make you laugh? Yes or no? Then it's a comedy. If it doesn't make you laugh, it probably isn't. Well, right. But, have, but have, have you ever seen a Tom Green film? I um, have, unfortunately. I've seen Freddy yeah. Got Fingered. That, there you that, go. That was not a good movie with a really bad title. Yeah, but there you go. Now, somebody might look at that and say, you know what? That's pretty funny. Now, I don't no know where doubt. those people are, but there are people out there. There are people that will look at anything that I've done and say, I don't think that's funny. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can see comments. Some people will say, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. I uh, go to the IMDb page and look at the comments, you know, Polish vampire, worst movie ever made Two more people down best movie I've ever seen. You know, <laughs> so you can't really worry about what people are going to think. If you can make a movie that you are entertained by that you enjoy, the people that are on your wavelength will also enjoy it. I kind of look at comedy as like, Here's a middle range that only people can hear that can only hear this much. Those are the ones that watch like sitcoms, Friends, um, King of Queens, you know, these shows that are on television. Then you can go out of that range, let's say up here. And that's the comedy that only dogs can hear. OK, that's where the comedy gets a little crazier, a little offbeat. South Park, Family Guy, things like that. Some people can look at South Park and Family Guy and stop because of the language I don't want to see this. It's dirty Go beyond the language and say, oh, this is damn clever. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. I try to strive for the family guy, South Park kind of comedy. I'm not saying my movies are anywhere near as clever as those shows you, are. You are trying to convince me <laughs> that your movies are only in the range that dogs can hear. I think so. I think so. I think that now there are some people, if they're friends of mine, they're, they'll give you a little bit leeway. OK, you know, that is kind of disgusting, that joke there. Yeah. But it's Piro. OK. Yeah, we know he's not doing it to be mean. There was a character in Nudist Colony of the Dead. He was half Chinese and half Mexican. His name was Juan Tu. And there was a bit in the movie where the car won't start and they say, hey, you can't hotwire a car. You're part Mexican. He goes, yeah, well, I'm part Japanese, too, and I don't know how to bomb a harbor. Now, that I thought was a pretty funny line. Well, some people, you know, didn't think it was quite so funny. And I'm sure today, if anybody sees the movie, they're probably going to even be more sensitive about it. But, you know, the actor was fine with it. I was fine with it. I don't have a problem with it because, again, if you just loosen up and, and lighten up 
and enjoy it and laugh or not laugh. If you don't like it, turn the channel or close, you know, stop well, watching. Well, one thing for sure is um, you have never been accused of being politically correct. Oh, God, hope not. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. I assume you, you have sold your works to the various cable networks and so on. And so mm -hmm. my guess is you have over time had to interact with executives of one kind or another. Um, you're, you haven't gotten away from scot-free of not dealing with any kind of executives, right? Rarely. Um, a couple of times when I made the higher budgeted films, yes. But now what I do is I just turn it over to people that do the job for me. I'll, I'll, I have a couple of people that represent me. There's a company called Cyclone Entertainment. They handle my films right now. They deal with the crap. You know, I make the movie. I say, here, do something with it. Send me a check if you can. <laughs> Other than that, uh, have a good time. So I'm so, not even so you're not in a, you don't really deal with executives. You, you, you're you not used to getting notes from people, right? <laughs> oh, Lord, no, no, I don't even have a tie. I mean, I basic. I'm probably not. I'm not even wearing pants now. No, I am. I'm wearing pants. But, I thank, thank um, goodness. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, well, I, otherwise I'd be distracting myself. But <laughs> I tell you, I think the uh, the thing is, I I. I, I don't belong in the corporate world because, again, I, you know, I, I have people that they follow the book, you know, they get the permits in order. They I mean, I do get release forms from the actors because I know somewhere along the line you might have an actor. And this has happened to me before where years later, an actor might say, uh, you know, I don't know if I want you promoting this on your website because, you know, I'm doing bigger and better things now. And I say, well, you know, you did sign a release and uh, it is part of your legacy. So, so that, that's good to know. You you actually go through the motions of legal machinations. You have them sign releases and things like that, the performers. Yeah, it's, it's a very basic release. You know, he has permission to use my movie. That's basically or to use my picture, or to use my likeness. Uh, I'm sure that if some really serious lawyer tried to break it down, he might find loopholes in it. But it's basically, you know, you want to be in a movie. I want you to be in a movie. Here's our agreement. Sign here. Let's move on. But you go through that. You go through that. You jump that hoop, so to speak, in order to feel comfortable yeah. that, that somebody's not going to come back at you later and bring suit against you. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just a small precaution. I mean, I probably should do it with more things. I probably should do it with locations, too. Because let's say somebody decides that they don't want their business seen in, in my movie anymore. Uh, I never really got release forms from um, from locations because most of the time they're friends of mine that can I use your house? Can I use your restaurant? Whatever. Um, do you, do you, do you take insurance when you shoot? No, no never do that either. So you're running no. that risk, aren't you? I drove without car insurance till I was like 48. Oh, <laughs> you know, uh, I probably shouldn't say this. My house is, I, I don't, I, my house isn't insured um, because one day they tried to raise the price and I didn't do anything. I said, why are you raising the price? Well, because, you know, inflation. Well, that's it. I'm done. I've lived here for 25 years. Nobody's broken anything. Nobody's had any problems. I'll take my chances. If the house burns down, well, then I'll put a tent up in my backyard. And, and same with production, then, obviously. <laughs> What's that? Same thing with production. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have never had any serious things happen on any of our films because, again, we don't do anything that... Probably the riskiest thing was having the guy hanging from the helicopter. Mm -hmm. that one you don't you don't do big stunts. I'm trying to think. If you go back to the spy who did it better, I did a James Bond parody back in before I started feature films. It was a short. We went to Vasquez Rocks and we had a stunt man jump off of one of the high peaks onto an air mattress that we smuggled into there. We were so much riskier in our twenties. That was probably a risky thing to do because he could have missed the pad, you know, and, and we didn't even think like that because we were kids. You know, you're in your 20s, you think you're in, you know, invulnerable. Today, I probably would still take some of the same risks, but not quite as many because if you're in your 20s and they go, oh, look at these dumb kids. When you're in your 60s, it's kind of like, look at this dumb adult, you know, <laughs> you should have grown out of this by now. And I kind of think I am. I mean, this may be my last movie, the one that I'm doing right now, because right. I did think i've got the energy to keep doing these you know because again you're a one-man show basically you know and well, that's and, what you are you're a one-man show you really put everything together yourself you don't really have you have no office space outside of your home you don't my, you don't have a secretary you don't have any kind of infrastructure you're a one one man right. band that's me and I, I work out of my bedroom i have an editing room set up in my bedroom and 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 clearly you're fine with that it's not a burden to you to do it that way 
No, it isn't. I mean, I, I suppose if we had gone back about 10 or 15 years and somebody said, we'd like you to work out of a studio and we'd like you to, you know, do a housing, have a housekeeping deal at Universal, I'd have probably been okay with it. I'd probably still be okay with it, you know, but I, I don't know if I'd last because it's, it's like the reason I never served in the military because I, I'm not good with authority. Mm -hmm. So if the sergeant started yelling at me, I would probably just tell him to chill out or something. And well, there's no question know. when you get into a studio situation and you're spending their money, they want things a certain way. <laughs> and I understand that, that the two movies I did for studios, Buford's Beach Bunnies and Death Row Game Show, they would come in and tell me certain things I needed to do differently. And I would do it, you know, and, and reluctantly sometimes like uh, one of the movies came out and they re-edited it a little bit. I didn't have final cut. And it, I was sick over it. You know, I really felt like I had been violated because I'd never had that experience before. Mm -hmm. Come to find out that, you know, Quentin Tarantino sometimes has that issue. They, you know, there's, there's very, there are very, very few filmmakers in the system who can get away with a uh, final cut. There aren't very I, many. Of course. And that's mainly because, you know, you got to cut your movie to an R rating. And if you've got stuff in it that would give it an NC 17, most of the time they're not going to allow you to do that and that's why the later on you can come out with the director's cut on blu-ray or something but well, uh, you, you yeah. also hear stories that are not movies that even challenge the um r rating uh but that but somebody's come along and decided it doesn't work for whatever reason and they recut it to make it to to you know some producer decides to cut it to their taste and right. um th that happens all the time too it's not just sex it's not just violence um, right and but it is so painful they, well you know, as you a know, filmmaker and, and i've spent a, i spent a career in hollywood writing s scripts for tv shows and you have no control at all it's work for hire and you, somebody else is going to revise you and that's you just get used to it. it you become a mercenary and that's how that works right it, it had it happened to me more i'd have probably gotten used to it i i tried to take attitude like when i did buford's beach bunnies which was really a work for hire it's not a movie i probably would have made on my own if i if i wasn't given the offer to make this movie you feel like you're a parent you know you're taking you're, you're nurturing this child you're going through the nine month process of watching it grow oh sure but then you then you have to give it up and oh, and that's something oh, I, oh, sure. I never it, wanted to... it becomes your baby and you that ba you want to protect that baby and that's that's the way that works exactly. for, for many artists but in the business of show like m movies uh, tv uh theater uh dance opera and so on um there are there's big money involved usually, and there are lots of people that have various fingers in the pie and you have to deal with all of them. I understand that. But then again, that's why I, you know, I've made 11 movies. Most of them I've had hundred percent control over. And I look back at those movies and say what went right or what went wrong and take hundred percent responsibility for it. But the two movies that I didn't have complete control over, I kind of feel like I need a disclaimer. Well, you know, I wanted to get that shot a little differently, but it made me do this or I wanted to change this or whatever. And you, you, unfortunately, you can't sit there with the audience and say, here, let me tell you what happened with this movie before you watch it. No, you so, can't. No, obviously it, it, it lives and dies on its own. Yeah, name is attached to it. That's the problem, you know? So, like, so I have been speaking with um, independent filmmaker, um, Mark Perot for oh, just a little bit less than an hour, and we're going to wind this thing down. Um, Mark, in all of your experience, and I'm sure you've had more than one of these, can you tell us or share with us a story that is either weird, strange, quirky, offbeat, or maybe just plain funny that has happened to you? Uh, yeah, I think there's one. <clears throat> Actually, there's a few, but the one that stands, stands to mind is when we were shooting Curse of the Queer Wolf. Um, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but you should have if you I haven't. Think I, I think I have, but it's been a while. Well, there's a scene, there's a dream sequence in the movie where after the guy has gotten bitten by a queer wolf, he has this nightmare that he's almost in a scene from Deliverance. And there are these two queer Billy characters that meet him in the middle of nowhere. And they're going like, well, what's your, where are you going there, Nelly? Well, I'm going nowhere, just want to be on my way. Oh, you ain't just going to go run off here without first squealing like a teapot, are you? Squealing, yeah, you know, wee! Well, we were shooting in this woodsy area, and we had these two guys, one of them, John McCafferty, who's an actor that's been in most of my films, mm -hmm. had these fake teeth put in. He really looked scary, right? So I'm down below him with a camera, try, I'm shooting the scene, 
trying not to laugh while he's doing this whole bit of dialogue and he's going wee, wee, wee. <laughs> and all of a sudden <clears throat> he stopped he, he, he breaks character he goes no it's okay well it's okay what are you doing turns around there's a couple of people back there that were about ready to attack him i think <laughs> because i'm down on my knees with a camera i'm down on my knees with a camera shooting this i suppose from their angle it probably looked pretty nasty and uh, i had to turn around and say no we're, we're just making a movie here no problem <laughs> okay <laughs> anyway and they they, they 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 took their six-year-old daughter and walked away um no, i made that part up there was no kid there but <clears throat> but there was that. And, and again, sometimes, you know, when you're in these situations where it doesn't look like you're making a movie because we didn't have lights, we didn't have reflectors, we just had a small camera. And, you know, and I'm down on my knees in front of these teethless guys or toothless guys going squeal for us. <laughs> Is that funny that's, enough for you? That's, that's uh, yeah, that that's that's a uh, both funny and a little scary could have been you know if been somebody out there with a gun they could have shot you so you're you're lucky yeah it, it could have happened there's a lot of things like i say today i'd almost be terrified to be in a public place doing weird crazy things like that i i i understand things have gotten much stranger over time all right last yeah. question for you today mark um do you have a um, solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to someone that's maybe just starting out in the business or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to some other level. Now your level is your level, but what, what, what advice would you give someone who's starting out today? Okay. I guess I would tell you, first of all, to make sure your bills are covered, you know, don't think that this is going to be the next Rocky going to make a movie that's going to change your life. Go out there, you know, uh, shoot your project on weekends, evenings, whatever, make friends that's the other thing i would tell them get people involved that like you that want to be a part of your project that want to feel like they're contributing to it i think we kind of touched on this earlier um bring them yeah bring them into this as a team you know and but you you have to really want it i mean you have to want this more than anything else because there are a lot of roadblocks that step up in the way you're going to always have actors that are going to flake on you at one time or another whether it's uh, they don't like the movie there, you know, they get bored with it, they get tired of it, they realize that they're not getting a dressing room or they're not getting catered meals or they're not getting limousine service, whatever. You know, some people have their own preconceived idea of what making a movie is or what being in a movie is. And when you do it on this rock bottom level, you have to make sure people want to be there. Now, because there's no paychecks involved, the people that I use want to be there. I have actors that show up on days they're not even needed just to help because they like what's happening. Um, a real sweet gal named Deborah Lamb, who was in Death Row Game Show, uh, I hadn't seen her in years. She just came back into town not too long ago, and she now stars in my current movie. Hmm. And she's been a sweetheart. And she's not only has she helped out as an actress in the film, but she helped with casting. You know, I needed somebody for a certain day because an actor flaked. She got us a replacement the next day, nice. you know, and... And she, you know, but she's a good example of people that want to be a part of it. So to, to talk to your brand new filmmakers, I would say, be nice to everybody. I don't care who they are. You know, there's no percentage in being rude to anybody and help them too. If you've got a friend or you know somebody that needs help with a movie, help them. You know, if you've got time, obviously don't take time out of your schedule if you're working, whatever. But if you've got uh, this weekend available and somebody needs a, an extra or somebody to hold a light, do it for them. And then when you got a project, call on them. Can you help me hold a light? But that's it. You have to really enjoy what you're doing, love the people around you, get them to respect you and like what they're doing with well, you. And you're there. I think that's really solid advice, truly. It doesn't matter what level you're in. It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what you're doing in your life. Two things, pay your bills and make friends. And I think if you just do those things in life, you're a far step down the road from uh, having to run from somebody or create uh, some kind of a shield from other people. Um, I think that's a, a solid way to think about how to be in the business. Mark Pirro, this has been an absolutely terrific hour on Story Beat, where you said some things I just was, you know, I knew you were going to go go down certain roads, but you uh, you exceeded expectations. So I, uh, I, I'm honored. I thank you kindly for coming in uh, to be with me today on Story Beat. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. 
If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.